Hi, I'm Lisa K. Donner, along with Andrew Moran, Sarah Cowgill, Jeff Charles, and James White. And this is the Conservative Five, Liberty Nation's online TV news program. On today's episode, In the Handbasket, where are we going? We'll discuss the midterms and the odds of a clean sweep in Red Wave in Jeopardy. And we'll talk about what we used to call the civil liberties liberals and the out of touch GOP in highbrow politicians and the crudité crowd. And of course, there is news of a disturbance in real estate and we'll investigate in U.S. housing market in recession, followed by an uplifting attempt at entertainment in Just for Fun, Volume 18. All this and more coming up on this edition of The Conservative Five. The writing seemed to be on the wall, a big November red wave. Democrats suffering the consequences of the Biden bunch were so far down in the polls. Well, it seemed it was all over but the shouting. Since last November, Democratic candidates have been losing the popularity race, but now some polls are telling us they are closing the gap. Hello, panel. So good to see you. And thank you, Sarah, for taking over while I was on vacay. I am so glad you're back. <laughs> well, it's because, good to be here with us. They're unruly. They're unruly at I, best. Friendly faces. I'm going to put them through their paces today. Okay, Jeff, you penned a piece for Liberty Nation this week on the Democratic comeback. Maybe, possibly, give us a scoop. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it, 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 there are indications that that's what's happening. Uh, but the the polling is kind of all over the place. Um, uh, last week, a real clear politics average had uh, Democrats and Republicans tied. Uh, Five thirty eight had Democrats leading by one percentage point. But then you have uh, Rasmussen and Trafalgar that that still shows that there's still a five to seven point gap between Republicans and Democrats with Republicans in the lead. But this is still a decrease from what it was even before. And there could be a lot of factors figuring into this equation. I mean, you got the Supreme Court's decision on uh, Roe v. Wade overturning it. Uh, you've got the raid on, on Mar-a-Lago and some and gas prices are going down. But I mean, there's still a chance for uh, Republicans to stretch ahead. I, I say I still think that they're probably going to take take the House, but the Senate is in question. Jim, you're our uh, hound over there for the House and the Senate. Uh, how do you see this shaping up? Well, I don't, you know, we've we've had a lot's happened in the last few weeks. We've got a uh, we got that raid on Mar-a-Lago, which I think the Democrats think is going to help them, but I really don't think it is. Uh, I, I think if anything, it's going to fire up Republicans. But then you've got this, you know, here just yesterday it was you got the uh, the announcement about the student loan forgiveness a campaign promise uh biden made you know year and a half ago and or more and then now that we're a couple of months out for midterm and needs to drum up votes here it is you know i have to say i i i, I think this is going to be challenged I, I don't know that the executive branch has the power of the purse like this that uh that can forgive debt is anybody else sort of wondering about this when nancy pelosi said that a couple months ago she said that president joe biden doesn't have the power to forgive student loan debt so they're going to so that, right with that that supports your 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 supposition uh, lisa yeah. how many times do you find yourself in agreement with nancy pelosi <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, been that's the biggest thing situation. this week i think is that People are fired up about forgiving student debt. There is there's not a lot of happy people out there over this one. So I think that's going to factor into some polls maybe next week. But then again, think about it. It's August. Uh, we're not anywhere near Election Day. A million and one things can happen between now and then and usually does. So, you know, just waiting for the next shoe to fall. Plus, Callie Ballard, she wrote an excellent article recently talking about how the media keeps parroting the same thing. Biden wins. Biden wins. They're referring to the Inflation Reduction Act, talking about falling gas prices, completely forgetting about everything that's still going on in the background. You have the U.S. economy in a recession. You still have inflation elevated. Debt is surging. Consumer demand is on, is on the decline. So overall, I mean, if, if the media can, can keep spouting that nonsense, then perhaps enough people will believe it and head over to the voting booth. Well, never for, underestimate uh, the power in the narrative. All right. Let me ask you guys this, because I think this is interesting. The legacy newspapers are all like front page stuff with abortion. And I think what's happening is some of these states' laws are kicking in, and some of them are, are pretty onerous. There was one today that kicked in. Uh, I don't know what what the penalty was for the obstetrician that performed an abortion, but it was really pretty severe. I don't know if it was life in prison or something like that. Really scary stuff. 
do you think the abortion uh, issue is starting to get traction and may be a factor in November? Anybody can take this. Yeah, well, when I'm looking at polling, I mean, there, there are certain polls that indicate that abortion is an important issue because of the Supreme Court decision, but it still isn't outweighing inflation and gas prices and everything else that's going on. I think what's happening, Lisa, is that the, the focus was on inflation, jobs, and the economy, but then the abortion issue came up and then the raid came up, and that's sucking all the attention away from those economic issues. But I still think there could be a rebound because even if these issues are on the news cycle, people still know what they're paying when they're going to the grocery store today, and they know it's a lot more than it was before. But let's face it, there's got to be some kind of disconnect between the Democrats and the Republicans. Well, of course, there's lots of disconnect. But I mean, a disconnect in the student loan thing, because they're doing it, I think, because they think it's going to get them votes. There's some 40 million people. But, you know, the Republicans are saying, on the other hand, wait a minute, there's 300 thousand people that uh, 300 million people that don't have are going to pay for the 40 million i hope that made sense but (laughs) you know what what i'm trying to say is there there is a you know a divide on how this is going to land politically what do you guys think well most people that have um no student loan debt you know don't want this. It, I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, Green Party, or or an independent. Nobody wants to pay for somebody else's poor decisions or um, for their inability to pay back a loan. No, nobody wants to pick up somebody else's um, debt. They want to take care of their family. They don't want to take care of Joe Blow in Connecticut. Yeah, you but know, a big part of their uh, their issue here is is uh, if. Uh, here's the thing, $10,000, $20,000, either way, you're making the folks that d- that aren't going to benefit from this in the short term mad. Um, but by only by limiting this to $10,000 for people that didn't get Pell Grants and $20,000 for people that did get, you've got the vast majority of the side that's uh, that's clamoring for this mad because you didn't do enough. Yeah, but, let's like face it, but let's face it, um, you know, if if you're one of those people that's getting a ten or $20,000 dollar forgiveness that that's a lot of money aren't you going to go out and vote for the dems absolutely yeah. not but i am going to pay my car off <laughs> and pour and pour it into your robin hood account and stonks go up but if i mean well if i had one thing about student loan forgiveness is that the republican party they're doing this all wrong instead of insulting you know millions of americans who who would get the ten thousand dollars and saying oh you, you just pay your own way they're not talking about the root cause of how higher education is in shambles they're not talking about how you know pr- the government's in a predatory loan business and how the government caused a whole skyrocketing tuition so their whole pr campaign is just messing it up instead of just talking Talking to people why this is a bad idea because it doesn't affect, doesn't cause the the, uh, the uh, fundamental issues with uh, post secondary. That's education. always their biggest weakness that they don't provide an alternative. I mean, Democrats are saying, "Oh, well, not no, let's not fix the system. Mm-hmm. Let's just you know forgive some debt." While Republicans are saying, "Oh, that's not fair. That's not fair." But Okay, so what are the Republicans' uh, suggestions for fixing the the broken system? You're right, Andrew, but the problem is that Republican messaging doesn't really really align with that. I think now my Twitter account, my main pin is going to be, Andrew, you're correct, quote by Jeff Charles. (laughs) (laughs) Check mark, Jeff Jeff Charles. He's going to be checking for that. Jeff's never on Twitter. No, no. All right. Well, any final thoughts on this before we uh, go into our next segment, which everybody's going to want to tune into because it's really funny. No, no comments. (laughs) Hearing hearing none. Big pregnant pause. Hearing none. I move to the close while the GOP is looking to reassert its mojo as November approaches. Thanks for the insight panel. There's been a seismic shift in the current Republican and Democratic parties. They sort of, well, actually, it seems like they've traded places. It's a political realignment not seen since the 1960s when the Democrats did an about face, shifting from the party of segregation to the party of civil rights. But it appears to many that the Democrats are focused now on money and power and, well, not so much the little guy. There's no denying the GOP of late has been touting itself as the party of the little guy, but Jim, will that stick? Uh, you know, it's funny you talk about, about the little guy and, uh, and and political imaging. I got a buddy who lives up in the Ozarks. And uh, not long after the 2016 election, we were just hanging out and talking. And uh, he mentioned how he had voted for Trump. Normally, he votes for Democrats, but he just couldn't back Hillary. And it blew my mind. I go, wait a minute, dude. You uh, 
you live out here in the woods in a house full of guns. You hate anything that smacks of government authority. And your words, not mine, new age hippie parents that don't spank their kids. What in the world are you doing voting for Democrats? And he goes, well, man, it just seems like, you know, they're the ones looking out for the little guy. Mm. And, oh, uh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. But, you, you know, know, so, I mean, there, there's definitely people out here buying the hype wherever it's coming from. But uh, my, my answer to him was, OK, man, have you uh, when was the last time you saw a politician of any party that was poor or broke? Uh, yeah, but the perils of, of, of blue collar pander, pandering have been going on for a long time. There's, there's a famous story, and I, I remember it. I, I looked it up to get some of the details today. 1972, Sergeant Shriver was the vice presidential candidate for George McGovern. Y'all know how that ended. But anyway, <laughs> Shriver is is uh, campaigning in uh, Western Pennsylvania, Ohio. He stops in Youngstown. The steel mill lets out. And, he, and he's campaigning with Tip O'Neill. And O'Neill said, you know, your brother-in-laws and Sergeant Shriver's brother-in-laws were, of course, the Kennedys. He said, your brother-in-laws were notoriously cheap. Why don't you buy the guys around? So Sergeant Shriver says, everybody get a beer. Beer is all around. And then he says, but I'll have a cavassier. <laughs> Yeah, I you think know, that's what we're seeing now. Well, that should <laughs> sum it up quite nicely. Tip O'Neill went crazy. He's yeah. like, what did what you do heck? that for? This administration in particular is, is you know, passing the canapes. I, I swear. Any, any, <laughs> our energy secretary now thinks that low income people should spend their money on winterizing their homes and then get a tax credit in a year from now, um, a they can't, you know, purchase gas. But and most of them are re in rentals because they don't own their own home. And then you, you know, then they tack on the middle class by solar panels. Are you kidding me? You can't. Who's going to have forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars to equip their house with solar panels if they're worried about how much they're paying at the pump and if they can afford hamburger for their hamburger helper tonight? I mean, where's this disconnect coming? It used to be uh, when Bill Clinton was running, he asked George Bush, um, "Do you know how much a loaf of bread costs?" George Bush probably never bought a loaf of bread; somebody else did it for him, and he didn't know. And 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 that is completely the script has been flipped now these people have no clue they 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 literally have no clue what they're putting you know just the john q public through when it comes to the democrats their elite their elitism is leaking i mean they're, they've been trying to gaslight the nation about inflation people are going paying a lot more money and they're trying to make it sound like it's a good thing even with the gas prices cnn published that piece with that was like oh you should consider that a, a tax raise or whatever and i'm like you guys just don't get it but you're even seeing the shift even in in corporate america where corporations used to be buddy buddy with the republican party but now you see a lot of them going woke to pander to the far left. And it's that shift has been very interesting to see too, especially with this ESG movement going on. You're, you're seeing a shift in corporate America towards the left and not so much to the towards the right anymore. And now, now they're more antagonistic with the right. I mean, you saw the whole feud with Walt Disney and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. We're seeing more of that. Even after a, a George the murder of George Floyd, you saw all these woke corporations going even woker. And it, it's <laughs> it's been very interesting to see how they're bending to this crowd when these people re represent a small percentage of Americans. Well, we're equal opportunity deconstructors. And as somebody here has to remember, I think it was just last week, was it? Or maybe the week before uh, when uh, Dr. Oz, the uh, candidate in Pennsylvania, went to Wenman's. I think he got the name of the grocery store wrong. Uh, it's Wegman's and was talking about, you know, how crudités are so expensive. As Jim said in the setup before we went on to record, what what's a crudite? Is that veggies? A crudite. <laughs> crudite. There we go. You know, and especially in Pennsylvania and, <laughs> and the Mon Valley and everything where he is, it's not a good look. Say it with me. Charcuterie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Really? Charcuterie. Acuna Matata? Charcuterie. Yeah. It's hard to see a guy like Mehmet Oz, you know, this multi-millionaire, 10 properties, being you know, a representative of coal country in Pennsylvania. How can that guy represent a Republican Party that supposedly transitioned to the working class? Why Donald Trump endorsed that guy? Please, someone explain to me why that happened. He's making a mockery of the Republican Party. Somebody well, on Trump's team well, is taking wow, advantage Andrew, of Biden's wow. crack program. That's what's going on. You really don't like him. What did you say, Jeff? 
I said somebody on Trump's team is taking advantage of Biden's crack pipe pro- program. I think that's what's happening. <laughs> I also think I also think I think it's a case where Joe Schaefer he wrote a great piece a few months ago where Donald Trump and a lot of America First Republicans are so desperate of having of, of, of wanting to be liked by a lot of the mainstream media, particularly in Hollywood on Donald Trump's side. So I think Joe Shaver made that case of perhaps that's why Trump endorsed Oz, because he wants to be liked by more folks in Hollywood. Or maybe it's a, it's a 4D chess plan where he's trying to get more Hollywood folks to uh, transition to the GOP. But Mehmet Oz, I mean, his politics from, for 20 years has been just left leaning. So, so you know, again, again, I'm just befuddled of, of why, Moz, why Oz is even on the, on the Republican ticket. You know, I'm always amazed at this because I really think it was, I have to say, I think it was Donald Trump that really turned the uh, Republican Party around from the elitists, you know, to the, the the group that cares about the little guy. And yet he is a very opulent, uh, it's out there for everybody to see how wealthy he is. But at the same time, I don't know, maybe because he grew up talking to construction workers or- yep. It's it's an interesting thing that happened with him and the people and the way he's seen. I mean, nobody sits around. I think among he, the he 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 went to them and talked to them the way they talk to each other. Yes, and that yeah, and and no matter no matter what the bank account size is, or you know, if you were wearing a ten thousand dollars suit, um, when you talk to people. And say things like, you know, well, you'd be in jail to Hillary Clinton on national television. That's what all of the people thought was a good thing to say. I mean, it it seemed a little outlandish at the time, but he related to uh, the no collar and the blue collar people. And they they've hadn't had that in decades. They hadn't had anybody paying attention to them. You know, I think think if, if if neither Biden nor Trump are politicians, People would want to hang out with Trump more than Biden. I mean, I mean, the the everyman, the the people that you see in Pennsylvania, they could sit down and and hang out and have a conversation with with somebody like Trump because, yeah, he talks just like they do. They probably were thinking the same thing. Yeah, because you'd be in jail because that's what you would hear somebody, a regular person say. You don't normally hear a politician say that, though. But with Biden, Biden is is stiff. He's elite. I mean, and and he's just not as relatable. Right. And if you go back historically, I mean, Democrats aren't the only ones that pander to the blue collar. The Republicans did it with George H.W. Bush. He didn't know what a grocery scanner was. He was so amazed at the grocery scanner that we'd all been using for like a decade. You know, uh, Liz Cheney, I believe, had uh, ink on her hands from her brand new pair of blue jeans, which she probably never wore. I mean, it's just not a good look. I think the bottom line is that Americans can, they reward someone being genuine and sincerity and you know whether you're rich or poor it doesn't really matter but are you being real with them well richard nixon if you go back historically richard nixon he was a a donald trump-esque figure because he was somebody who who was on the outside looking on the republican party he was someone who wasn't like the rockefeller republicans he always if you look at if you read some of the biographies of nixon including a great one by roger stone you know nixon was the type of person who who felt you know uh embarrassed being around more the elite side the northeast republicans who are rich and wealthy because nixon came from you know a dirt poor farm and you know he uh had to climb the climb the ranks and pay for his own way and he was real you know, you saw that in that debate where he didn't shave, you know, next to Kennedy. So, uh, yeah, he was probably the the, the predecessor to uh, he, the working man Republican. Let me just straighten that out. He did shave, but he, he was a guy that got five o'clock shadow. Let's just say that. <laughs> I, I think the bottom line is that the American uh, voter has a way of seeing through the fakers. Thanks, panel. The latest housing reports have some folks tripping down memory lane to the year 2006. Remember the housing bubble? It might be too early to tell if a market crisis is forming, but it's clear that the real estate sector has slipped into a recession. From falling sales to collapsing trust in the feds, the U.S. housing industry is getting walloped by an economic downturn fueled by, guess what, higher interest rates. So what's the data showing? And could this be as nasty as it was more than a decade ago? Andrew Moran, we go to our economic swami first. Well, mortgage applications fell 1.2% as a 30-year mortgage rate climbed to 5.65%. If, ever, if I think James will know that impression. 
I think no James on that. But anyway, so uh, new home sales, they tumbled about uh, 12.6%. Existing home sales have cratered nearly 6%. Wait, I can't go forward until you tell me who the hell that was. It's Visine. <laughs> you got to get the red out. Thank you. Oh, Ben Stein. Oh, ben Stein. Oh, yeah, it was okay. Ben Stein. Okay, I got that too. Okay. Oh. Hey, you and I were cracking up about that. I didn't really. get it. One so years. I, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I didn't get it either. Go ahead. Yeah, I had no clue. <laughs> But this real estate market, I mean, it's on a complete downturn. You know, mortgage applications are falling. New home, new home sales are tumbling. Existing home sales are tumbling. Pending home sales are tumbling. New housing construction activities is just collapsing. Overall, it's safe to say that this real estate market is in a recession. You see the surveys show that. You see industry observers saying that. So overall, I mean, this is just, this, this is a market that's on a complete downturn. And the housing market is a great indicator of broader recessionary effects too. But overall, I mean, and then if you look at the price growth, Price growth is also ease. However, if you look at some of the doom and gloom prognostic prognostications coming out, you have Fitch saying it's going to collapse 15%. You have a senior economist saying it's going to be like the 2008 housing crash. But I will say in all this you know, negativity, I will say it's complete. It's a bit premature to declare that it's going to be like the, the, the subprime meltdown of 2008 for two factors. One is that the, the mortgage delinquency rates of, of 30 days past overdue, that's at 2% at the height of the, of the housing crash. Uh, more than a decade ago, that was at more than 10%. Uh, subprime mortgage, they account, they account for very little now of the overall housing market. So overall, I think the US real estate market, it's, it's on a complete downturn, but I think it's premature to call it a complete crash or Is collapse. Anybody out there wondering, I, you know, I had a friend ask me, she said, you know, what are you going to discuss on the show today? And I said, well, you know, the recession in the housing market. She said, so what does that mean? Is it good to buy or is it good to sell? And I'm like, ah, I don't know. Any ideas, anyone? From what I've seen out here, it's it's not a good time to be trying to sell a place. I see a lot of properties for sale going up down the road. Yeah. Nobody you buying. Know, six, six months ago, there there wasn't a house that stayed on the market more than a couple of weeks. A new listing would just go. And I, I live in the middle of nowhere. So uh, that alone is interesting because, you know, we're bringing all sorts of people out into the boondocks um, and houses were being sold for twice what somebody would have, should have paid for them. And now um, my friends in the construction industry that are, you know, dealing with this downturn, they have dropped their prices. They are laying off employees. It's, it's really not pretty around here anymore. So, uh, you know, I don't know what those numbers equate to, but I can tell you that when people go from having full-time jobs and so busy, they work six days a week to sitting at the pub at two o'clock in the afternoon because their job got called off, then there's a problem. But Jeff, didn't we, didn't we know this was going to happen once they started raising the interest rates, they ratcheted them up once they ratcheted them up again. You yeah. know, I mean, I, I know this because of a uh, Liberty Nation's brilliant economics correspondent, Andrew Moran. <laughs> Round of applause for Andrew. I mean, Yay, yeah. Andrew. Well, well, here in Florida, it, it, it's it's an issue. I mean, there's higher median prices. Mortgages are, are mortgage interest interest rates are are up. Um, inflation is an issue. So we're having a lot more listings here in Florida too. Um, last month. Uh, sales of single family homes totaled uh, it, it was down 22.9% year over year wow so so yeah so it, it, it's okay. an issue and it's it's it, it's hitting everybody can i touch upon what uh, Sarah said, sorry, I just want to yeah. touch on what Sarah said quickly. Two things. Uh, one is that when she mentioned about, you know, how is it going fast? Uh, if you look at some of the, the, the recent data, I think it's the, either the NAR data or the Census Bureau data, it shows that the month of supply, which measures how long it would take to exhaust the current level of activity based on present sales activity, uh, it's at 10.9. I mean, okay, you gotta, you gotta that, slow that down. Number, you gotta slow down. Say what that, does that again. even mean? So yeah. the month of supply <laughs> data, it's at 10.9. This measures the, uh, how long it would take to exhaust current levels of inventory based on the present sales activity. 10.9 months, 10.9 years, 10, 10 months. 10 .9 days. 10.9 months. It's at 10.9 months. And that anytime that number goes above nine, there's a, a, a steep economic downturn that happens shortly after. And that also is going to lead to a massive decline in prices. And also, uh, Sarah mentioned about, about jobs. If you look at the NHAB housing index, anytime that goes up, uh, or excuse me, anytime that goes down the way it has been, you see uh, unemployment rate going up as well. So, I think those, so you look at the technical analysis of those two, there's a huge, huge indicator for the broader economy, which okay. is not, not AHB, National Association, Association of Home Builders. Builders. Right. <laughs> All right. 
Woo! <laughs> All on you. Okay, guys, there will be an exam quiz following. <laughs> anyway, we this is really strange, Jeff, because you know we were in Florida in, over the spring and we left, and the housing market was super. It was on fire. I mean, and you're saying it's really slowed down in Florida now. Well, that's that's really very yeah, telling. It, it, well, it has slowed down quite a bit. I mean, and in the, it may get better uh, going forward. But I mean, there's also the issue of people who came to Florida because they wanted to get uh, away from those COVID rules in, right. in their states. A lot of those people are starting to go back home now that, you know, the, the COVID uh, restrictions are easing up. So there, so I've, I've been reading a little bit about that and that, that could, you know, possibly free up even more listings. Yeah, well, I hope, you know, in this economy, I hope we all know how to pitch a tent. Thanks, panel. <laughs> We're back to have a little bit of fun and shame each other for the horrible answers to the questions I have in my hot little hand. It's part of our show that we call Just For Fun. Okay, are we all ready to play Just For Fun? Yes, let's go. Do it. Do it. No. Today. Hey, and by the way, people, have fun. This is the fun segment. All right. Today we play fill in the blank. I'll read the sentence. You fill in the blank. If you blow this, you have no business hanging out with me. Don't you dare talk to me like that. All right. Let's start with you, Jeffrey. And everybody, feel free to chime in. Jeffrey, one, two, three, four, or five. What are you going to pick? Four. Four. Okay. If. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis ran into California Governor Gavin Newsom at a bar. He would blank. He would buy all of his drinks because Gavin Newsom did him a huge favor by cutting those stupid ads on July 4th and, and after about how Florida is just so horrible and it's not a free state and that California is somehow more free. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, you're free it not was, to buy a car that has gas yeah. in it. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was. The, the, it was the biggest display of a lack of self-awareness that I've seen in a long time. And I don't even know what he was saying. He did the same with Texas Governor Greg Abbott, too. It, it, was, it was insane. Like, this, I don't know what this guy is thinking. Maybe he's just trying to preach to his choir. But he cut the ads in Florida. Like, people, people are going to see that in Florida and say, oh, I guess I'll move to California. No, dude, <laughs> People no, in New no, York you, you ain't reading the did room. that, too. Didn't New York City do yeah. the same yep. thing? Put out ads that we, we love LGBTQ and... You know, we have culture and they're red. Well, they also or, love illegal really aliens it. until the buses start pulling up to the Port <laughs> exactly. Authority of New York. In my backyard. Like, Imagine the confusion they're... for those poor aliens, too. All this time yeah. they've been here and how much New York wants them. And then. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine that. All right. Now we're going to go to Andrew. Pick a number. One, two, no. One, two, three or five. Four has been taken. Two. Two, numero two. Are you ready? Yes. The FBI was probably looking for blank in Melania's closet. Oh, that's easy. Uh, considering how the FBI is. Oh, no, up. no, no. You can't know. You can't know that fast. Are right. you really came up with something good? Good. Yes, yes. The way the FBI is full of gossip queens and leakers and love all this rumor and the National Enquirer, they probably looked for Melania Trump's love letters to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. You know, if you look at if you look at, the pictures, if you look at the pictures between between Melania and Trudeau, you know, though that they, they were locking eyes and she was, you know, making googly eyes at, at Trudeau. Of course, not anymore because now he had that haircut. He looks like Jim Carrey from Dumb and Dumber. But I thought he didn't time, have any eyebrows. How could he make googly eyes at somebody? Didn't he have fake eyebrows, Trudeau? Wasn't that the big story? In yeah, that, 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 that's been one of the did for a while. Of, uh, Trudeau. <laughs> Just like he's a son of uh, Fidel Castro. No, that's no, also no, like, no. theory. Oh, my God. Yeah, I bet it was the uh, the love letters between uh, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. That's what they were really looking for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they had to be loaded with those. Or, all that collusion. Or maybe it was Rocket Man and Donald Trump. Maybe it was Rocket Man. <laughs> Yeah, a little rocket man. Oh, I'm man, I hadn't thought about that in a while. I'm telling you, Kim, you can really, really do something with this, you know, waterfront real estate. We can imagine the condos you can make. You know, Kim, that Kim, can I tell you something? I love I love Pyongyang. I love playing ping pong in Pyongyang. Yeah. That's how much I love it. OK, Kim, let's strike a deal. No more nuclear weapons. OK, good. I don't think so, darling. 
Sarah, one, three, or five? Yeah, I'll go in the middle. I'll take three. Three. All right, you ready for this, everyone? You might have to help Sarah out. This is rough. While on vacation, Dr. Jill Biden looked forward to blank. Oh, well, she's probably going to a, a all-inclusive resort, maybe like Sandals or something hitting the beach, where they have daycare for her husband <laughs> and uh, adults to talk to at the pool <laughs> and maybe some cabana boys that will, you know, fill up her drink and, uh, you know, make googly eyes at her, as you like to say. Dr. Jill, can I clean your st- sunglasses, please? Yeah, let me right, help you right. out there. Oh, Put some lotion boy. on your back. Maybe just Keep some time away, away from, from yeah. time away from the sippy cup. You know? I bet that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, well, I mean, if I was going on vacation and my husband was for. Joe Biden, I would make sure that he either wasn't there or they had a place to stick him because that would not be a vacation if you're cleaning stick, up drool and nose, dealing with that. Stick your nose in a beach novel, you know, <laughs> one of those summer beach novels and don't come yeah, off. Good book, Lisa, good book, Lisa. strong drink, no Joe. Can, yes. can you Can you repeat that question? Okay. Uh, While on vacation, Dr. Joe Biden looked forward to blank. That's the answer, blank, because she contracts everybody in that administration contracts everything from Joe Biden and including his uh, dementia. So I think that's the answer, blank. Blank. The answer. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay, Jim, you've got one uh, or five, I guess. One or five. Numero uno. Number one, it's about time, Joe Biden blank. It's oh, I have a good time, one. I have Joe a good Biden one. blank. Learned uh, how to ride a bike. Trouble. I can't. I can't steal uh, Andrew's blank on that. I don't think All you right. can answer okay, that honestly. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm piggyback off of Sarah's uh, vacation idea. It is. Uh, it's about time Joe Biden spent some more time with his family, or learning to ride a bike. And I've done some dumb things. And I'll do dumb things again. Or basically anything that gets him out of the white house. I mean, he spends more spent, time uh, with his family. That's not funny. What's wrong with you? That's out of the white to, house last year. To, 136 to of those politics. are personal days. Want to spend more time but with look my family. What he messed up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He just needs more time away from the job. Exactly. Okay. I'm last but not least. Numero five. Well, at the JLo Ben Affleck wedding, you couldn't resist making off with the blank. Sarah, I'm sorry you weren't invited. And Jeff, of course, I, I managed to get <laughs> I love Ben Affleck. I wouldn't have gone if I was paid to go. Oh, go sure you right? would. You could have you could have worn uh AOC's dress, the white one with the red, you know, tax the rich. No, no. All right. Yeah, you can't not go to Batman. Boy. I would have okay. I would have burst into Garth Brooks' friends in low places and said, Yeah, get out of here. Or done a, a version of 48 hours. But anyway, while at the J Lo Ben Affleck wedding, I couldn't resist huh, making off with a paper engraved napkins. So why what? not? What? The paper engraved napkins, you know, that say J Lo and and uh, Ben forever <laughs> and ever with a little heart. I mean, don't you want to have one of those? Be Lo, you just be steal there. something good, like, you know, worth money or something if you're there. Yeah. Well, you take a napkin. What's the point of going? I, I'm the kind of girl that asks, you know, can I buy this towel when I'm in a hotel that, you know. <laughs> but, um, I'm making off with a Batmobile. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. That's it, guys. It was supposed to be fun. I guess the jury is still out on that. Thanks for tuning in and playing at home. And that's it for our C5 panel today. Check out our other C5 shows and segments on your favorite video platform, YouTube, Vimeo, Rumble, we're on them all. As well, Liberty Nation has its own Roku channel where you can see all of our productions. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, surf on over to libertynation.com. Join us in the member zone for $17.76 a year. Thanks to our fantastic editor and post coordinator, Frank DiOrio, and our executive producer, Sarah Calgill. I'm Lisa K. Donner, Editor-in-Chief. Thanks for joining us today. This has been a production of LibertyNation.com, where truth is making a comeback. <laughs>